Well, I didn't put any of my credentials on here, and I do it for a reason. Um, I'm an advocate, and it means to add a voice. A lot of people are frightened when they hear advocate. They assume it means adversarial, uh, lawyers suing. It doesn't mean that at all. I spend a lot of my time mediating for these children so they have the right to go to school. I do have degrees in science, phys ed, education, and a postgraduate in individual and systemic advocacy. Um, I've taught many advocacy courses over the years, but I think my most endearing credential is I'm the mother of two special needs children who, like Heidi's, have made it. Uh, they're through university. One's a research doctor in Sweden, and the other one is a high school special ed teacher in senior sciences. And as my husband says, they're married, we have grandchildren, and they're off the payroll. <laughs> I can't tell you enough that the battle you go through with your children and how you make it in, in, and see them be successful is important. There are many tools today that were not available when our children went through school. I want you to know I've passed grade 13 English three times <laughs> because we didn't have wonderful things like Kurzweil readers um, and computer systems at that time. We have that now. But in those days, I reread those books to those kids. And Sometimes that's what we have to think about is how do they get their information. I think we had, well, Heidi said something this morning that's really important. Inside every one of us, and don't tell me you don't have it, we all have a little bit of ADHD. We're all there, some of us are more impaired than others, and I'm sure a lot of us felt uneasy as we were described this morning of the different things that we have. Sometimes they say that it's, you know, menopause, but I, I swear that I've had it my whole life, this <laughs> cognitive thing of shifting. And I was one of those kids that if you mention, say, the teacher might have been talking about ships coming in, uh, and in the meantime, my mind shifted quickly to the boats being at camp, gone fishing, and I will have answered a question totally irrelevant. And they said, where'd you get that from? And I would have to go back and go through the steps so nobody ever knew when we were young what ADHD was. We were just those kids. So, we, you know, we have to understand that we've come a long way to put labels on things, but it's always been there and always will. Our job is to learn how to deal with it. So we have to look and see what's happening for our kids in the school systems. Here is one of our biggest problems. Education in Canada is governed by each particular province. So everybody has a different take on things. And there's no national policy. So it has huge problems across the country. If you want to see what these financial implications are like, on your disk that you have is some of the presentations that have been made by other professionals on the financial implications of not looking after ADHD and what impact it has on the workforce. Maybe on the people who've changed jobs any number of times. So we have to look on what it's doing to us as a society. It's billions of dollars in lost productivity because these are really bright minds. We just need to figure out how to make them work. Unfortunately, what we're seeing across the whole system is, once again, the focus on behaviors. Now, when somebody asked this morning, <laughs> um, how come there's a difference when children are identified, some at two, some at 10, I will tell you it's the behavior that catches everybody's attention. We never catch people being extremely gifted and quiet and smart. But boy, I'll tell you, do we ever catch them being bad? And as parents, as educators, as professionals, we have to understand that we've got to get that past our mind. And we'll talk about this behavior as we move along. Alberta is the only province that will identify in the physical or medical category. But the big problem we have with all of these, I'm going to flip you up the slides, and you have them on, on your paper, is how the provinces look at this. And what you're going to see is that most people require comorbidity. In other words, we can't give you help with your ADHD unless you got something else. How would you feel if you went to Sunnybrook with a broken arm and your wrist was broken and they said to you, I'm sorry we can't see you unless you have some other sickness. But if the bone is sticking out in the Alberta model, we can set your arm. But in the meantime, you can go away and you can you know, learn how to handle that pain. And when something else comes along that gets in the way, and we'll give you a few strategies to handle the pain, uh, but then we'll maybe look at it. 
But we do this to children. We say to them, unless you got something else, unless you're comorbid with something else, well, you're just a bad kid or your behavior. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat in IPRC meetings and had it said that one of this child's needs is, he learns, needs to learn how to take instruction from adults, he needs to learn how to self-regulate his behaviors, he learns, needs to learn how to follow instructions, and they go through this whole list of what the child needs to do. And I stopped them and said, for, just for one minute, if the child could do this, would we be at this meeting? So what we need is to change the wording around instead of blaming the victim is to put in strategies on how do we help the victim, the child who, children are not born bad. We've got to get past that nature. And I have to tell you that in all the years I've been doing this, I think I've only ever seen one child who was strictly ADHD. And the only reason I say that is because I wouldn't let him stay in my house long enough to, to see if there was anything else. And this... <laughs> It's the only family, and, and uh, there's many of you who've been in my home, because that's where I, people come to see me, and there's only been one family in the 30 years I've been doing this that I've actually asked them to leave. And this woman brought in this child who she said, he is not ADHD. And he walks through the door, and if you've been in my home, you'll see I have all these little ornaments that I collect from where we travel in the world. And within two minutes of being in my house, that kid had touched every ornament, had been down the basement, up the stairs, checked the computer, came back down to the living room, I said to him, what do you mean? And here she's doing the same thing. And, and I said, the reason why she didn't think he was ADHD because he was a mere image of her. And I couldn't... And it was the most frustrating thing because I couldn't explain to her that she had to help him because she had the same problem. And so, anyways, eventually I said to her, let's go and talk out on the, on the front step. And we sat out there and talked, and I said, you really need to go back to that doctor, and you need to talk to him about yourself, too. But that was the only time I asked anybody to leave my home, and because I, I didn't know where the kid was going to go next, and he was off the wall everywhere. And we don't often see that. We often see a combination of things. But it's always the behaviors that get them into trouble. The other thing that's important to you notice is that most of the provinces have what we call the inclusive model. In other words, they're in the same classroom, and we put a few behavior mods on the kids. And sometimes there might be some extra support. Most times there's not. Inclusion without support is dumping. Those children don't get anything. In other words, they get more, 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 more frustrated. It just continues to build on their self-esteem. And these kids have all kinds of things that are going on. And and in, in how do we get people to understand that this is a really, truly debilitating condition? Nobody chooses to be like this. You know, we don't, we don't choose to have what's given to us. Uh, genetically, we get a lot of it. I always remind my husband that the kids are just like him. <laughs> you know, you know the, the, I'm sure the learning disability part must have come from him because I don't let him take my telephone calls because he writes the numbers down in reverse orders or any combination or permutations you can imagine. But you have to think about how this impacts on their life. Nobody would choose to be like this. And I, I get upset when I hear people saying that the kid says or the kid does this deliberately. Children don't deliberately do this. And so nationally we have, we have this, this issue of, of non-consistency across. Somehow we have to get to our federal government that says we need something that's national on this disability line. But today I'm going to focus on what Ontario says because that's what we all know the best. And I'm not going to re re read all the regulations that I put in here. They're there for you. But understand that Bill 82 came into effect in the, in the 80s. And before that, if you had a child who was uh, disabled in many ways, they didn't get to go to school regularly. If you had a child with cerebral palsy or developmental handicap, Down syndrome, they used to go to special schools. I remember the one in the town where I grew up in was called Kin Valley, and those children never saw regular children. They were sequestered, secluded. Um, and so the movement came on to bring children and recognize the fact that not everybody learns the same into Bill 82. And, when, and some of the boards embraced it quickly, others were slow. And the Toronto Board was one of the last to put in place its gifted program. And I can remember when it started off, Marilyn was one of the first children identified into the gifted program. And fortunately in those days, uh, they looked at what the strength was first, because uh, 
nowadays, if they see that there's anything more, they, they try, well, they try to defer to something else. And I've learned over fighting for the years for my kids is that we all have to think about looking at the whole child and think about what they need, whether it's communications, whether it's their intellect, whether it's physical, any of these things. You have to make sure you look at the whole child because as parents, we don't just send the head and the foot to school. We send the whole child. And I think that if we could just focus on whole children and know that this, this comes as a package, because there's many things that happen where we think that it's just one small piece, but it, in fact it's the whole child that's reacting. <clears throat> this comes right out of, out of what they were talking about in the early years. It's generally accepted that the goal of the education system in Ontario is to provide an appropriate education for children, such that they are enabled to reach their potential. When children are not learning in a way and are at a rate that their parents and teachers would expect, the special education process may, may become appropriate. That's all very good. But in, in, in Ontario, they came up with initially a, a committee that's called the Identification Placement Review Committee. And this committee would listen to the case and then they would decide whether the child was exceptional and whether you come up for uh, special ed services. In the early years after Bill 82 was enacted, the committee would have the parents at the meeting and then they would ask the parents to step outside well, they made the decision. And at that time, I had flaming red hair and a hot temper, and nobody was going to ask me to step outside while you talked about my child. And so I phoned the ministry and asked them to be on any committee that would change this, because the only thing I could see was if we didn't work as a team, and if they made decisions without me being there, how could we make sure that my child got what she needed? So I thought it was only going to be a couple meetings, and about 10,000 later, here I am. Yeah. So I, I, I made it my business to work with committees to change the process so that you stay at the table and you are active participants in how a child's life is, 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 is focused on that committee sheet. Over time, we've put together a couple of manuals to help parents. The latest we have one is called the Advocate's Journal. It shows you how to chart your child's life so that you're a proactive person. The whole thing we have to understand is we've got to work with school systems. You can't fight. You have to figure out what your child needs and then work as a team. In Ontario right now, there are five categories, behavior, intellectual, communication, physical, multiple. <clears throat> well, some boards have chosen not to use multiple anymore. They're actually putting everyone, everything out there. But according to the ministry regulations, still, it does exist as multiple. I would like to see the behavioral one imploded because it has such negative connotations that you can't get help post-secondary if you have come through school on a behavior designation. But if it is delineated into one of the other ones, whether it's a communication disorder, whether it's a physical health disorder, then it's recognized. But you know what? I haven't seen anything in the Human Rights Code that recognizes a bad child. And children who are placed in that, you might not think that the other kids don't do anything about it, but I will tell you that the cruelest and meanest people around are other children when your children are in those classes. They know. It's like the wounded chicken on the hen yard. They go after those kids. They are always in fights. It's like they always have to defend their self-esteem and where they feel that they belong in life. The students with ADHD are not currently being served appropriately by the definitions. They often find themselves in behavior classes where the focus is on trying to control the symptoms. In other words, we see, until you learn to behave, we can't teach you. Um, I won't tell you how many times I've been to a meeting where they're trying to place the child in a Section 23 treatment program, when in fact nobody's really had a look at what are the things we need to put in place to maybe change this child's life. So, you know, we, we focus on the behaviors. We become hyper-focused. It's not because we're mean and vicious people. It's how we were brought up ourselves. You know, I, I was brought up in a house of six children. It was my mother's way or the highway. You know, it was very strict parameters. And, and, and it's ingrained in us as human beings to, be, to, to, do, to follow along how we were brought up. And it's only through reflective change over years that we can change how we treat people, and our, especially our children. You see, behavior is a form of communication right in itself. You know, behavior is the result of a need not being met. If you take one thing away from what I say today, that is one, something that I will stand by. And these needs could include psychological, physiological, neurological, social, emotional, environmental. 
Now, before anybody looks at an ADHD designation, which is psych- psychiatric, I'd like to make sure that you've got all the physiological things checked. Have you checked to see whether or not these children have any dysfunctions in liver, kidney, pancreas, thyroid? Have they had a central auditory processing test to see if they actually process the information? When you've done all those things, then you go to the next stage. Have they had a good vision test? And something happened last week that makes me really glad that Teresa Broussard's coming this afternoon to speak to you. I was asked by uh, the medical community to go and check on these twins who were in a DD class, developmental handicap class, and the dad was sure they weren't. We went to the, the school, and the school was sure they'd placed them correctly. And these children were, had been premature. They had vision problems. And we went into the room where they were, and we were standing behind them and spoke to them. Neither child moved. And the ed assistant reached over and touched the boy's hand. He turned around and waved. So when we went into the, meet, the IPRC, I said, I'm sorry, uh, we defer this meeting. And that's why I said, until you can show me that these boys have had a hearing test, you can't continue. We sent them to see Teresa. Within an hour, she'd sent them to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Neither boy had any hearing. They, they were so plugged with infections and hearing loss that uh, they, we have to go through the whole antibiotic routine to see whether or not they need surgery. But nobody had picked up that they couldn't hear. They just thought that they weren't with it. So you must always look at the modalities. Make sure that those things are intact before you start going on the other things. Um, children, children who... If you, if you track your children when they have breakdowns, some, some children will have a breakdown about a half an hour before lunch or before supper, and you always have to ask yourself, hmm, if I give them a shot of apple juice or a cheese string or something, will that behavior go down and go away? Gosh, is there anybody in our family who has any history of diabetes? I wonder if they're hypoglycemic. Should we have that checked? And you always say to people, Make sure you talk to your doctor about this. Make sure you ask the questions. Does anybody in your family have a history of thyroid? You know, um, I remember seeing a little boy who was off the wall behavior-wise, and they wanted to put him in a treatment center. And then sometime between the time when we started working with the school and when we got to the meeting, he had kidney surgery at sick kids. Guess what went away? All of these strange behaviors. Turns out it was the kidney disorder. You see, and this is why they say, make sure you check to make sure it's not physiological first. Then you start on the rest of the things. But we know that ADHD is real. And we know that, that, that these things we check in on. But they all have impact on a child who has ADHD as well. <clears throat> now, given that so many students are identified as having ADHD, this is a really tough task for the school system. You know, and behavior mod... Is, is becoming blasé. I, how many times do you flog a horse? You know, the kids don't remember what you said. And I like Heidi's thing about giving your kids multiple instructions. I can still see, see me saying, Karen, go upstairs, pick up your dirty laundry, and bring it down to the basement for me. And I'm waiting. Karen, she says, what? I did what you said. And what did I ask you to do? You asked me to go upstairs. So. <laughs> Okay, what was two and three? Oh, I don't know. She hadn't processed the second two. So in all of this, that's what you're going to hear about what cap disorder is. She didn't get the second and third message. Once I, and wasn't that Karen was mean, malicious, bad, you know, she just didn't hurt it. So we have to think about, you know, when we give out multiple instructions. And it's one of the things I worry about when, you know, when we, we only try to behavior mod them. Because people will say, how many times do I have to tell you? You were penalized yesterday. You did time in the quiet room. I, if anybody's kids are doing time at quiet room at school, I'm really concerned. Because school boards are not supposed to be doing that, isolating children. And yet I have seen isolation rooms that would just make you weep. And yet, who, who looks after the children? Now, children in Ontario don't have many rights. You have the right to go to school when you're six. The, the next time you have a right, you can actually have a right to special education when you're four. The moment that a person is taken on the registry of a school, then you can actually request an IPRC. And I've had parents be told, oh, no, we don't do that until after they're, they're six. Not true. You can have an IPRC when you're four, if it's, if, you, if it's necessary to put the proper things in place. 
And I have this theory that if you know there's something wrong, why would we try to disrupt a classroom and, and cause a huge problem for the teacher? If you know, tell them. You work as a team. We have wonderful, wonderful teachers out there, but you can't put them at a disadvantage. You know, you're frustrated at home. Think about that poor soul at school having to deal with your kid all day long. You drop them off and you go, <laughs> yeah. And the poor teacher, I, you know, we have to give everybody has to be armed with the proper amount of information, okay? Now, interesting that since we know that 80% of the students with ADHD have accompanying learning disabilities, it's that we have to make sure that the testers are looking for that. We don't just want to tease out the behaviors. We want to look beyond the behaviors and tease out what it is. What is it there that we can do to make sure that we know what the children need? You know, if they have a learning disability, then we can put them in the communication category. Once again, it's always trying to find that comorbid disorder. And you see, ADHD is, is uh, something like, um, like Asperger's. You could have it right across, except Asperger's is in the high end. But think about epilepsy and, and ADHD. Anybody can have epilepsy. Anybody can have ADHD. And you can be in any one of the categories. You can be in the intellectual, the communication, the physical. We can all have those things. But we, see, we need to figure out what to do to, to move it ahead so that more, more things can be done for these children. It's, it's all about how do we make it work. And surprisingly enough, a lot of the things that you do for an ADHD kid will help all the regular kids in the classroom too. You know. So, if there's no comorbid disorder, and I have to tell you, I haven't yet found a gifted child that doesn't have a learning disability. A child with a learning disability isn't gifted in some area. And I'll say the same about ADHD. There's always something else. I mean, it's not often that you have anything that's pure. It, it, it's just not the human genome to do that. You know. But if it's not, then perhaps offering a, an approach with some behavior in a multimodal approach. And that's the one that was the, the, gold, the gold model that was talked about in Heidi's presentation where you have uh, medication, you have family, you have school working as a team. Um, the current practice of either ignoring ADHD or automatically identifying as behavior exceptionality shortchanges a student who could benefit from an LD placement. And that's very important because it's the smaller, less noisy class, less clutter. A lot of our schoolrooms today... Uh, when we went to school, people say, oh, there wasn't that ADHD. We went to school? Yeah, because we sat in rows and columns, and Attila the Hun had a yardstick going up and down the rock columns. And we were, we were quiet was there. It was not the, the socializing, visiting that we see in the round tables in the schools of today. And we may have thought it wasn't there, but it was there. We were just staring out the window. Um, my inattentive daughter melted the entire box of crayons on the Radden grade one because there was nothing for her to do, and she was bored to tears. So and she, had, she did a lot of color matching of crayons down the, the, the Rad, but, you know, it, it, it didn't service her needs. She was sitting by the Rad and didn't have anything else to do, so she melted crayons. Okay, now, there should be universal access of, of all Ontario age school pupils. They might say that. That is not necessarily the truth. Uh, it depends where you are, whether you can have access to special programs, or whether some boards who have adopted the total inclusive model, even though the ministry says there must be a range of placements, and if you want to read all those documents, they're all on your disk. That's, that disk is my hard work. And it's, it has everything that's been published from the ministry on it. All of the, the educator's handbook, for, be familiar with it. It discusses all the rules and regulations and the involvement in the participation of parents and guardians. I want all parents never, never, never to miss an IPRC meeting because you need to be part of the process. Anytime you decide not to go, you've become a passive observer and you need to be active participants at all times. Your children depend on you. Now, due process is, what the, is the legal stuff. This is about when you have to be in school. And there's no justifiable reason for staying home, although the boards right now are using this. They've been warned by the Human Rights Commission that they should not be excluding special needs children. And the suspensions, and there's a little ploy that's going on now that I find absolutely disgusting, where children are suspended, given a 21-day suspension, you, or a 7-day, anything over a 3-day. You appeal it, and just before you get a chance to go before the board to appeal, they pull it. And they say, oh, well, no, we, 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 we won't go that way. And therefore, it never gets in the books. In the meantime, your child's been out of school. 
and it's very frustrating. And so when you challenge that, the next thing they do is they do an exclusion where your child is not allowed to go on school property. Now, human rights has yet to, to rule on that one, but it's very difficult because the children we see being removed the most are special needs kids who have what we call the behavior issues, the ones that are associated around Asperger's, ADHD, uh, k kids who don't have that self-regulation in knowing or the social skills to know how to do things. And it sets them up. And somewhere along the line, we have to realize that these children have the right to go to school. They have the right to be there all day. I won't tell you how many children in the city right now are on one or two hours a day, and that's it. They're not allowed to go to school. How unfair. These kids need more schooling, not less. But we need to have the right people there. And I don't blame teachers or principals. I blame a, a ministry system that hasn't changed in how we train our teachers since I went through in 1972. Our teachers need better equipment and better, better stuff. We've come a long way in identifying and teasing out what's, what these children are. But you know, how unfair is it that we don't help our teachers? We don't give them what they need to be successful. How would you like to go to work every day and have the child from hell in your class? You know, and, and, it, it, and that's the way some people feel, and it's true. You know, you, you have to understand where the teachers come from, too, but as parents, we're struggling, too, and I think if we all get on the same page, you'll be surprised how much we all think alike. Um, appropriate. Now, interesting, they don't define appropriate in, in the law itself, but they let precedent take place by all the different tribunals, and you can actually go into the ministry's website and read the tribunals, and it always comes out with what they think is in the best interest of the child. And that, if, if anything, means they, they need programming. And yet, somehow we've let these poor ADHD kids slip by us all, and we've got to do something to improve that. Now, an educational program is based on modified and or accommodated uh, continuous assessments and evaluations. If you look at your child's IEP, Individual Education Plan, it will tell you whether it's been modified, accommodated, or alternate. You need to know what all those mean, okay? Now, the services that are, are needed should be outlined on there as well, okay? Now, there's a provision that there should be programs and services mandatory by the ministry. The guidelines to accessible education from the Human Rights Commission are on your disk. You don't have to go on the website. I already put them there. Read them and see that you do have rights. The child does have rights. What we have to do is we have to figure out how to make sure it's happening in a nice way. You have to be accommodating. You have to work. Okay? You have to be involved in the procedures. You need informed consents for assessments and placements. Now, a lot of parents think that if they don't sign the IPRC form, that, they don't have, that means that the child can't be placed. If you haven't signed it after 30 days or appealed it, the board can place. People don't understand that. So if, if they decide that your child's going to behavior class and you say, no, he's not, and you decide not to sign it according to the law, if you don't do anything in 30 days, you have to, you, they can place. So you always have to be on top of these things. And you have to be there and you have to understand what's going on. And, and informed consent means you understand what you're signing. You don't sign a form that gives carte blanche for the school to call all your doctors and rake in all your files. That's not informed consent. If you're actually looking after your child, you should be bringing copies of assessments and reports to the school to be shared. And then, especially if they're third party reports, for instance, if you have a psych report from the Clark, or if you have a neuropsych from somebody at Sick Kids, share those that are meaningful. But you don't, if they're third party reports and you don't think it needs to be stay in the school, you can take them back. Okay? But you share. Due process is the right of the parent to appeal the identification and placement. Now, a committee might decide that your child is behavior and they want to place them in an intensive support program. This is the, 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 the cutest little words now for the behavior class. And you don't want that. And on the bottom of the form, it says, uh, yes, no to identification, yes, no to placement. If you don't agree, don't sign that form. And they'll say, well, tick no and sign. Never sign that form if you don't. The rules are, and I've sat on a number of committees where we've looked at appeals, if you affix your signature, even if you tick no to both, if you sign your name, there is a degree of acceptance of that placement. So if you don't want that placement, you don't sign. 
But you don't leave it there. You have to either ask for them to reconvene the meeting or to, to uh, appeal it. Now, the principal refers a child to an IPRC. That's normally the process. Parents have the option of requesting in writing. If you write a letter to the principal requesting an IPRC, they must do it. Many parents have told me, you know what, we've given the letter in and nothing has happened. If that happens, you call to a larger authority because the law requires that the IPRC be held if the parents put it in writing. All right? so if you just say, if they say to you, oh, don't worry, your, your child's come up to school team and we'll let you know, that means you're, you're, you'll probably not be hearing for a long time. If you really want an IPRC to get some rights and responsibilities put on paper, it's important that you put it in writing. Parents have to receive written notification of when uh, the IPRC is going to be, and they have to have written permission from parents for any psychological or health assessments. You have to give permission. Nobody can just walk in and talk about your child or read about your child if you haven't given them permission. You know, it's, it's such a breach of confidentiality when this happens. So you, as I say, you, be, you have an active role to play in making sure that everybody understands how your child ticks. They start gathering information to be shared at an IPRC. It could be a psychological assessment. Educational testing is done by the school. Your child can have tests that show what grade level he's reading or math, and, that should be, and that's continuous assessment. That should always be done at school. Um, medical reports, if they're applicable, speech and language assessments, psychiatric assessments, for instance, if you've been to see the Asperger's group at the Clark, um, occupational therapy assessments, complete hearing and vision assessments, physiotherapy, uh, classroom work portfolio, report cards. Never mind the marks that are on report cards. Okay, they don't tell you a lot. Read the comments. The ability of your child to socially make it into school is there. And I think somewhere, I hope it's still on the disc, there's the, the, the little parts where they mark all the different abilities of your child. I think that's still on the disc. If I, have, I think I've left it on there. But each one of those categories has 10 tick marks in there, and it shows you how that it, they came to that idea of, you know, needs improvement or whatever. But it's a skill that I'd left in there for staff. Third-party reports, such as sports teams, clubs, that show the whole child. If your child plays hockey, if you have ADHD, what position do you think they play? Goal or defense. Why? They need to have the whole game in front of them. And it's often been said that they feel that may, many of the goalies in the NHL have ADHD. And why do you think that Gretzky and Lemieux, even Sid the Kid, score from behind or get a lot of their points from being behind the net? Because the goaltender has 180 degrees of peripheral vision. He can't control the puck always with his vision here. So they're always in a way of setting up or scoring from the corner. And they don't realize what they're doing, but that's how they can beat these guys. They found their weaknesses, and it's because the goaltender is so busy focusing on the whole game. And you watch them. I mean, they're classic ADHD kids in, in motion all the time. Before, your ADHD, uh, yeah, before you, get come, you come to an IPRC, you should get a written notice 10 days prior to an IPRC. You also should get a copy of the parent's guide. And, surprise, surprise, you should get a copy of the IPRC package that was sent into the IPRC. You should have that because how do you know what they're talking about? And maybe you have more information to add, but if you don't know what they're talking about, and it, it's your right to have that package. So the IPRC package should include what went from the board to you as well. Even if it's stuff that you provided them? With? That's all right. The, you, want, you want the IPRC package because they will have been asked to do a tick list of performance and stuff. You want to see what's been said about your child. Because you have to be active and positive. And if you see something where there's a, it may not be quite right, you can actually get the doctors to provide you with what you need. That's why you need 10 days to have a good look at this and make sure that what you're doing is in the best interest of your child. Parents inform the school if they're coming. Never waive the fact. IPRCs are supposed to be held when parents can come. And I've had them say, you only get 10 minutes from 10 to 10, 10. I hate to tell you, but when I go into an IPRC, that IPRC is over when I say it's over, or we ask for a deferral. And I say to the parents, your child's life can't be based on 10 minutes. If it's more extensive, the polite thing would be to ask for a meeting when you have more time to discuss. You know, and, and what happens is people go in there, and 
I will tell you right now, for staff and for parents, parents go into that meeting with their hearts, not their heads. And it's really important that you take somebody with you whose vested interest is not in the emotional liability of the situation, okay? They get carried away with the emotion. And I have been known to take um, designated uh, parents, somebody, somebody else. Uh, I've, been ta- I've taken grandfathers. I've taken uh, somebody who's totally unrelated. We called, we called the child the uncle of the child. And I just hand them my portfolio and I ask them to take notes. They're not asked to speak. It's to take notes and to, to, to record what's going on so that you can evaluate after. When I talk to parents after we've done the meeting, what they heard and what was said may have been quite different. And the, because of the emotion of their child being discussed. We rarely get invited to IPRCs for the warm fuzzies. And it's one of the reasons why I will tell parents if you're, if you're emotionally spent, don't sign that form in that room. Take it home with you. You don't have to sign then. Go home and think about what you heard. Make sure what you heard is what you understood. And if you don't, ask them to reconvene and explain it to you again. It's okay. You know, this is a, a, a life-changing meeting you're at. This is a legal proceeding. This is not something to be taken lightly. Every 90 days you can recall that meeting. You, that's the rules, okay? So that it, it, you're not bound in stone. And, for instance, I will tell you that um, over time you will see children who are diagnosed with behavior. Then it comes up by the time they get to grade four and written expression is so difficult they can't keep up with the writing part. They, they might add learning disability to it. They might also, some, some children who have te- done the grade four gifted testing might come in test gifted. So we got a gifted LD kid with a behavior problem. Finally... Somebody does an OOT report on them or they've seen something and they get to see the right people and you find out the child actually has Asperger's. It might take all the way to grade 9, maybe 10, before you get that actual. But so all along, you have to go annually and you're going to change stuff. You're going to make sure that whatever's on there is current, that the reports they have on your children are current, that you don't let yourself be dragged into only focusing on the behaviors. If you can figure out what it is, you can actually then drive what's happening to the child and so that you, know, that you don't just let them use the ADHD to marginalize, that you actually look and see what's happening and how the child's breaking down inside. The IPRC committee, if you're going to an IPRC and you're reviewing what's happening to your child and the only people in the room is the principal, vice principal, and the teacher of your school, Where's the independent voice to see if this is actually meeting your child's needs? There should always be somebody, either the consultant from outside, so if you have concerns, you can talk. The the initial IPRC committee has to be three people who don't know your child. So it should be a supervisory officer from the board, could be a psychologist, psychiatrist, a social social worker, um, and uh, another person. So three people make up the committee. And they, re- they review all the information, and then they can make one of three decisions. The child is exceptional, not exceptional, or defer the decision if there's not enough information to make the decision. And a lot of parents think that they could just jump all over this, but that's the only thing that the committee can do. The committee can also make a decision on the type of service, whether you need to be in a regular class with withdrawal, uh, in a part-time program, half-time program, full-time program, an intensive support program, Um, Some boards have all these things listed, but all they offer is in-class programming. There's nothing else offered. There's no range of placements, and it's really difficult when you're arguing because they say, well, we only embrace the inclusive model. Once again, I'll say that inclusion without support is dumping. Now, the, the one thing that is problematic in all of the IPRC process and which frustrates the parents the most is the committee has no say on program. They can put program needs on page two and always ask where the page two is. And that's where you can list the extra needs that your child has. If you need to have a special education uh, form filled in for a computer system, if you need an FM system, if the, the child has other special needs that you'd like looked at, if you've got occupational therapy assessment. Don't, and, and the thing is, those assessments are come from the school. Once you go into school, all of the occupational therapy is handled by CODA through the school system. And those forms are in the office to sign for that. But those go on page two. But the actual content of the program, what your child is taught, there's nothing we can appeal on that. 
That's, what, that's probably the most frustrating thing is that children are placed in programs that are inappropriate for them, and it's not the, the, it's not the placement that's bad, it's the program, and we can't do anything about it. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a frustration that we haven't addressed yet in the system. <clears throat> for all of you parents, you need to prepare a list of what your child needs to be successful. You know, I call it the needs list. Um, if any of you have ever seen my journal, there's actually a, a list that shows you how to say what he needs. And do it from a parent's perspective. I've never seen a staff yet that hasn't looked at that list and they can actually put it in jargon terms what it means. But the, through the parents, like, um, you know, John needs to have only one instruction at a time. If you're doing that at home, the school would put on the IEP that he needs his work chunked. You know, you need, you, so we're talking the same language, but what you're telling the school is this is what happens at home. When John has a meltdown at home, this is how we handle it. Give them some strategies too, because sometimes the little things we do at home you don't realize are successful, but can be very helpful in the school situation. And if you communicate in that way, it, John's life becomes better. If you do this list, and you hand it to the person chairing the IPRC, they have to attach it to the IPRC by law. And then when they're doing the individual education plan, there's a requirement under the law that they would take your considerations into, into preparing that plan. So that your ideas are taken into account. You know, you shouldn't just be sitting there watching and then signing off. You know, you have an, you have an active role. Um, I once went to a, an IPRC for a child and they wanted to place him in a, he was autistic and he wanted to put him in a, a class where, uh, for developmentally delayed and the parents actually brought in a videotape showing him cutting and coloring and doing things in a quiet environment. Once we showed the videotape, he went into a communication class, he's doing fine, but he had, he had no language. And what we were, that they were doing, he was being marginalized because he didn't have a communication skill, but when in fact he had many other very good skills. And, and you know, over time he was taught how to use a VOCA system, you know, for, for, for speech and language. And, you know, I, I just pray somewhere down the road that we will find a solution to what this communication disorder is. And we can work forward to it, because I'd hate to think that we would put kids out of education um, and then find the cure. Parents have to be, asked to, be asked to be asked to review what's on the document. Once again, I'm telling you, if you don't know, don't sign. If you don't, if you don't understand it, don't sign. On your IPRC form, I don't want to see. Uh, John is being medicated with Redlin two times a day, slow release, whatever. No medication should be on an IPRC form. It should not even be on an IEP form. If you want to tell the school that they are medicated, you put it on a separate letter for the Ontario student record because that medication could change tomorrow if someone says their child's allergic to many things. And I've had people have this written on the document year in and year out and the kid hadn't been medicated for years. So you keep your medications off the sheet. That's nobody's business but your own. And you share it with the school to make sure that they understand what's happening. It's always good if you're changing medications to tell the school that you're doing it because we need to see if it has any dramatic effect. You know, um, sometimes the placebo works, uh, you know, and uh, other times it does not. But the, the staff needs to be with you on how, how it's happening. You need to understand that placement in a program has to fit two criteria where it meets the student's needs and the parents' wishes. It's not uh, if the school decides that's where your kid's going, sign here. This is all you're getting. I've had the or else has told us, and I've said, no, if the parents don't wish that, and that doesn't mean you get stuck in a regular class without support. It means that they have to think about different ways. And usually um, when the parents talk about this and work on it, it's like a minority government. We all work on how to figure out the solution to make it work for everybody. But when you dictate and just tell parents this is all they're getting, what happens is you turn the parents into adversarial people and they get angry because that's not what they want. So, and a lot of times why the parents get angry is because they don't understand. And communication, I have to tell you, uh, uh, an informed parent is your best ally and you will be the best ally. An uninformed one uh, can cause all kinds of grief. So, so remember you can always recall the IPRC. If a placement is not working, folks, 
you can actually pull your child out of that placement as well and put them back in the regular class. I will tell you that I have had parents with ADHD kids do that, and it's amazing how quickly that IPRC got recalled even before the 90 days. I haven't seen a school yet that's not willing to work on how do we resolve the issues of these children. Well, I've already talked about third-party reports. Those are the ones you bring from sick kids from all over. Um, all of your reports that you're bringing in are stored in an oct a document called the Ontario Student Record. Until recently, we thought that that was the only documents there were on children. Unfortunately, we found out that there's also an electronic file on your child. Now, ministry will tell you, they won't put it in writing for me, that children under eight should never be suspended or expelled. That... Uh, under eight. And I've, I've seen it all. And we often jump at this, and that's why the Human Rights Commission got in, because so many special needs children were being set aside. You will see on your desk, um, they're called PPMs. Those are uh, policy memorandums from the ministry. There's one on exclusions. There's one on what progressive discipline looks like. And you have to go through steps. You don't automatically use it as your way to get rid of a child. But unfortunately, it's a, it's a reality. And until we figure out how to support schools and support staffs, we won't be able to support kids. Because we are asking people to do things in some cases that they just aren't equipped to handle. The Ontario student record is kept in the school office. You have the right to see it at any time. Um, you don't have to make appointments. I would suggest that you never go when it's entry or leaving from school. Go when it's quiet. And I'll read what on the disc. The, on, the OSR uh, legal book is on the disc under ministry information. Read so you know what's supposed to be in there. And then you can check to see when you go in there what else is in there. And sometimes you will find things that shouldn't be there. And you can ask the principal to remove them. And you have to put it in writing. And if the principal doesn't, you ask the superintendent, and you can escalate up to have it removed. The one thing that we've, we've done, and is that we had thought that we had had information expunged. Um, for instance, a child who had many suspensions, um, informal withdrawals, whatever, because of ADHD and behaviors, was finally diagnosed on the spectrum with autism. Anything that happened prior to that diagnosis becomes moot. It doesn't count anymore. So we pulled it from the paper file. Little did we know it was still in the electronic file. So you have to make sure that you're, when you're requesting it, also that the Trillium file be cleaned as well because they track all this behavior forward. And, it, it, we, and we didn't know, and I, I've asked the ministry to give us a legal ruling on this, is how much information can they keep on the electronic file on your child? I personally wouldn't want anything on mine because anybody can tap into these things. And there are legal rights and responsibilities associated with the Ontario student record. You should be familiar with them. And you should peruse it from time to time, especially when your child is going to change schools or change um, uh, locations. Make sure that what's being going back and forth is what you want. Every special ed report will be in there. There should be a final copy of every year's report card. What shouldn't be in there are things like, you know, John hit Bill on the playground, um, you know, behavior type things like that. Uh, those things don't belong there. It should be, it's supposed to be that which is positive to the development of the child. Okay? What's really important is you've got to be positive, folks. It's really hard. The number one word I want you always to remember is calm. I don't care how angry, you've got to be calm. You know, our ADHD kids get a lot of it from us, and we might get angry, but when you go into the school, there's no point in screaming and yelling because... Just look where they get it from, you know? So we have to be calm. Power struggles accomplish nothing. You know, and all they do is cause more stress. Always be prepared to be organized. You know, I can't say enough about having your stuff organized. When people come to see me and I tell them, bring me your information on your child, and they arrive at my door with two uh, Dominion garbage bags full of papers. Those are the things that, you know, and then they say, you know, my child just can't seem to get anything done. And, you know, it, it's a pattern, so you have to organize yourselves as well. And that's where the journal comes in handy. Uh, you know, and you get your mind around being this way. You know, you have to be really proactive about what you're doing because your child is depending on you. Now, last time of exercise, last thing to do for fun, I'm going to close off before I take questions. I want, I want to give you a little talk about be careful how you talk to children. Everybody close your eyes. 
Close your eyes. No peeking. Because this is just you. Everybody has had problems in their life. Everybody has experienced things that people say to them. I want you to go back into your youth and think about something that somebody said to you that was so warm and so friendly that you feel good. And whenever you have a bad day today, you, that comes to mind and it takes all the pain of what's happening to you away. With your eyes closed, if you have that person, put your hand up. Very good. Now, erase the slate. Clean it all off. I want you to go back in your life as a child. I want you to remember something that's happened to you. Something that somebody said to you that was mean-spirited, unkind. Maybe you were the klutz in the class. Maybe you were the fat kid. Maybe you weren't the sharpest spoon in the drawer. And somebody said something that you really felt bad about. And if you could get that person today, you'd like to tell them, look at me, I did fine. Can you remember something that somebody said to you that's, that, that still bothers you? Hands up. Yeah. Everybody. We are, when we can do that, it's hanging on our heart. We've all been victims of verbal abuse in our life. And we have to learn how to let that go. And we have to embrace the positive. Because if we don't, we become the next abusive person with our children and we carry it forward. We all we have to learn, be careful how we talk to children. They're depending on us to be positive and support for them. Thank you. Absolutely. Behavior almost becomes what they call moot because behavior is part of the autism spectrum, which is Asperger's. I would, I would, um, I did one the other day and we made sure they had listed them as behavior first and I've, I've insisted on change around, and I put communications, autism, learning disabled, gifted, ADHD, and the board wouldn't let me drop behavior because he was in a section program. And they wanted to make sure they could maintain the SIP worker, the special incident proportion worker. But that's fine, you see. But it was in a cascading where he needed help the most. And just so you know, if your child is tested... And they, across the board, they always say for the gifted program they want 98 or 99. Um, and they're looking for a 98 across the board. If you have a comorbid disability, like a learning disability has been teased out, that score can drop to 94% across the board. So then you would be LD gifted. And, so that they then, and it doesn't mean that they don't look after the whole child. It means that they have to show you they're doing something for the whole child in their IEP development. Yes, and that, then you see, that's somebody who's not looking at what your child needs. You've got the whole child. You have a brilliant child. I have to tell you that both my children, as adults, still print. Marilyn's a research doctor. She still prints. When I do the teacher programs, I hand out a sheet of paper to everybody, and I say, in the upper right-hand corner, I'd like you to write your name and write me three sentences about what you expect to learn in my course. I have never yet read one thing that anybody wrote but what I did do is just uh, divide them into piles to see how many adults print it because those people can't listen and take notes. And that's why the disc got developed because I wanted people to have the information instead of trying to write it down because you miss it in big gaps. And so the idea is, is that learning disabilities, you adults print. 
And you have to just figure it out. So I said to Marilyn, as the research doctor, what do you do now? Because, uh, you know, she says I have a secretary. <laughs> My kids were one of the first ones computerized. They're whizzes on the computers. I have to tell you that when uh, I was doing presentations and I couldn't get stuff to fit, I email it to Marilyn in Sweden and she fixes it and sends it back. <laughs> Uh, you know, I wasn't of the computer generation. Remember those Fortran cards? That was what I, I, I can remember. The, 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 money, the money piece is interesting. If you look at the amount of money the school boards have received for special education every year since 2000, the amount of money they received has gone up. But what we're seeing is more and more complicated cases. And I would suggest if it's not working, we need a team meeting at the school with everybody involved, including Margo, and uh, see if we can figure out a way that they're going to deliver that program. A five grade spread in a class is too much for a child. And you know, all we're doing is setting her up for further failure. And you need, we need to sit down and talk about more, how we could make this work. And, uh, and sometimes I think what happens is the schools themselves don't know how to do it. And especially with the Asperger's, we bring in, they call the PDD team, but they're all trained in the, the, in the autism side, and they really don't understand that intensive behavior analysis and application of behavior mod doesn't work for those kids up there. And if anything, it lights a fire under them and they're worse. No, but that's what you need to ask questions. You know, always question who's trained. And, you know, the EAs work under an agreement. I would not like to think that they were asked to do something that's not within their parameters. And one of the things you'll see, there was a tribunal case, and it's on the, the actual conclusion of it is on the disc. And in that, we had the tribunal actually said that things that were required to be provided by professionals like a occupational therapy, a speech and language... Um, physiotherapy, those come under the Regulated Health Professions Act and they should be delivered by those professionals and we shouldn't be asking people who it's not within their training and this is why I worry for teachers so much because we put all these unnecessary things of delivering speech and language, OT, all this stuff on the teachers and they work under the Education Act and all those other people work under the Regulated Health Professions Act and that's not fair. All right, you have to look and see where your child, I'm, I'm looking at the slide that's going to tell you too, where your child is academically, all right? If your child is functioning at grade level, if they're on an accommodated program, they should be able to handle regular high school, no problem. Applied level programming. My worry is if we get into too much modification of the programming in grades four, grade five, grade six, we get into that slippery slope. By the time they get to high school, you've taken them out of education and they're into the transition programs or the two work stream and they can't earn credits. So you have to be making sure that this IEP that this child of yours is on, individual education plan, actually shows you where his weaknesses are so that you can look at filling the gaps. You've got to ask, how are we going to fill the gaps? Because I want my child to graduate from high school. Your child sounds bright. Your child sounds like the PDD type. He's over here. He's not quite to the Asperger's end, but he's in the middle between halfway up. So, you know, you look at all these things and you say, okay, now where can we go? When you pick Section 23 programs, those are treatment programs. Those look after behavior mod first, teach second. So then you have to look and say, well, where, where are his needs right now? Does he need the Section 23? I don't know. I don't know your child. But, <clears throat> but you look at the, the report card. If your child is coming through and it's got a, on the IEP, which has to be done 30 days after the IPRC, they have to have the first working model in place. What's IEP date in the province for a regular school year? When? Do you know in the fall what the date is? The Friday after Thanksgiving is always the 30th working day of the, of the year. That's when you should have your first uh, IEP in your hands, and you should have had some input on it. Okay? Keep that in the back of your mind. You should always be looking for it. Don't, don't go in there and say, I should have it. It says in the law. You say, oh, you're working on it. Can I have some input and help with it? You know, be, be, co be cooperative. Work on it. 
But you look on the IEP and it says modified, accommodated, alternate. Alternate can be for things like social skills, um, sometimes the computer technology cross-curricular. If it says alternate for academic expectations, like reading, writing, math, that means they've taken you out of education. Modified implies you're a couple of years behind grade level. You might be doing some of the grade six expectations, but certainly not half of them if you were in grade six. You might be doing some a couple months down at the grade four level. So you, what you're trying to do in your elementary panel is work those children on an IEP that gradually brings them up to being applied so that with extensive accommodations they can handle the curriculum. Don't leave these huge gaps because all they do is copy paste each year and the gaps just keep staying. You have to as parents be proactive and try and bring the gap in and get help from your professionals that will help you to help the staff figure out how to close the gap. Every report card. You should get a new IEP with every report card. Your child doesn't stay the same all year long. So the expectations have to be changed with each reporting period. And we didn't agree to the IEP. No. Nope. Doesn't matter. If you, don't, if you don't sign the IEP, the only reason they get upset with you if they're, if they're sending it in for ministry audit or uh, equipment. Uh, they just, honest to God, folks, it's hard to get people to understand that the IEP is something you have to work collaboratively on because we don't have the power to change anything in that. We just have to try and get them to do the best we can for the children. Uh, according to the human rights, you're not supposed to take away recess and lunch away from a child. Um, he's eating lunch. But you, the, this is where you have to get in there and be proactive and figure out what to do. Sometimes these children need a small room with five or six kids having lunch together, maybe playing chess, so they get through the lunch part of it. But to sequester them and isolate them is not the answer. You probably need somebody with you who looks at the whole child. You, you don't, well, I'll go right back and tell you that you don't just send the foot or the head to school, you're sending the whole child. And they have to look at the whole child because they may be able to use his better intellect to take away some of the deficits that he's suffering and, and get him going in the right direction. The, the thing is, they use this as a cute thing too, but it's progressive discipline. You have to ask yourself, if you're suspending them, why? What, what's going on? Remember, behavior is the result of a need not being met. And children will behave in certain ways for a reason. A really distraught young child, in especially like the kindergarten, early primary levels, will do one or two things. They'll explode, cry, or hide under the desk. So you have to figure out what is it that's sensory that's causing those issues. And sometimes, you know, I have to tell you that I do a lot of work with Asperger's Society as well, and we find our Asperger's kids, as this is typical of their behavior, and all they see is the explosion. They don't see what the antecedents were. And I'll have to tell you, parents, you have to look and see what happened before the breakdown. What happened that caused them to get so stressed that they got to that level? Well, you're here in the room with us. That's how you're here. There, there's no way. There is no mechanism where we could report because programs are moved around. Sometimes you have the most amazing staff one year, and that same program the next year can undergo a different administration, a different teacher, or the children change, and everything is disruptive. Okay, think about, think about uh, the family part of it, okay? Everybody, the, the analogy of the whole family on the waterbed, dad, Mom, the other kids in the family, the child with the ADHD, starts everybody bouncing on the waterbed, everybody's up and down, up and down, up and down. Finally, Dad's always the last one to bounce. 
Mom gets the baffles, gets them in the bed. We've got the kid medicated. Everything's quiet at school. The kid changes, teacher changes schools. Everything's everybody's out of sync again because everybody, including the child, will be at different levels of acceptance of where they are on the spectrum. They might be in denial. You know, that would be over here. Um, <laughs> acceptance would be there, and the kid, the other kids in the family are in just pure angry because it's destroying their life, and the kid that hasn't figured it out at all. And everybody looks around and they go, oh, look at that dysfunctional family. When in fact the family's not dysfunctional, it's just one child is driving everybody nuts. <laughs> so you, know, you have to think it every year the school's like that too because every year the school dynamics change. And what you have to do is prepare your child for that transition to the next change.